this is uh, an historical or session that deals with a historical topic, uh, which is an attempt to look at the what there was of a conservative movement or an American right uh, in the interwar years. Uh, who, who are its luminaries? Who are its most important figures? Um, and uh, in what way did they influence the future course of the American right? Did they have any influence on the future course of the American right? Uh, and finally, I think all of us will have to answer the question in the end, you know, are these people worth studying? Um, uh, should, they, should they have any relevance for us at this point in time? Uh, uh, I will be the third speaker. Uh, the first speaker, I, I think, is David, isn't it? David, David Gordon, um, who is going to speak basically on classical economics, the, the uh, free market thinkers uh, of the interwar period. If, if, I, if I'm wrong, uh, you, you can correct me after you rise to speak. Uh, and the second speaker will be Brian McLanahan of the, of the Abbeville Institute, who is also an academic, and uh, he will be speaking on Southern conservatism, focusing on the agrarians of the interwar period, um, and my remarks afterwards will be a kind of potpourri in which I will go over a number of important, mostly literary figures of the interwar period, you know, and, why, and I suppose why they are still worth reading uh, for their ideas as well as for their literary styles. So without any further ado, I will uh, present, we'll have our first speaker uh, on this panel, uh, uh, David Gordon, who will make his eloquent presentation. Okay. <coughs> uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul uh, said that I could... Uh, correct what he said about me in the intro what I was going to talk about uh, after I rose to speak it would have been rather difficult for me to correct him before he spoke uh, uh, well what I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, a split I, I'm going to be talking more about uh, foreign policy than perhaps one might have thought from uh, Paul's introductory remarks, but what I wanted to talk about was a, a, a movement away from the anti-war tendencies of that had happened after uh, World War One. In among the figures of the so-called old right, as Murray Rothbard called uh, call them, figures like H.L. Uh, uh, Mencken and uh, Albert J. Nock. And, and others, the, there was a tendency to, a very strong tendency of revulsion against World War I. The view was uh, prominent that America should never have gotten involved in the war. During the war, the uh, uh, World War I had been presented as by Woodrow Wilson once the U.S. entered the war as a crusade against the, the, the Germans, in particular the nefarious policy of the Hohenzollern Emperor Wilhelm II. So uh, in, this culminates in Article uh, 231 of the Versailles Treaty ending the war, where the uh, Germans bore exclusive, were said to bear exclusive responsibility for the war. And after the war, there were a group of historians called revisionists. Uh, Harry Elmer Barnes was one of the most prominent of them. Uh, Sidney Fay was another one uh, who said that this, the view that the Germans had initiated the war, the Kaiser had plotted the war, wasn't true, that the war had actually a divided responsibility, or as in the case of Barnes, it was more that the... Uh, that the uh, French and Russians bore primary responsibility. And so this movement became very prominent and it led to a opposition to US entry into World War, into World War II, that there was a great opposition to uh, Roosevelt's foreign policy. Remember in October 1937, in 
the uh, famous Chicago Bridge speech Roosevelt had called for quarantining the aggressors, by which he meant just uh, uh, Italy and Nazi Germany. But he seemed to, the the people who were opposed to the war said, "Well, what about the Soviet Union? Weren't they equally aggressive?" So we had among the old right figures there was opposition to the war. Now, the question, I think, is an interesting one. What happened after World War II? Uh, here, I think we have a split between the, uh, the, I, the isolationists, if one can call them, the ones who were opposed to the war. Uh, John Lukacs, whom I often don't agree with, I think it's right to call attention to this, but there were some isolationists who were consistently opposed to an interventionist foreign policy. They didn't like the new Cold War either. They said just as the, the, there had been an exaggeration of the threat from, uh, to the U.S. from the Axis powers, there was no need for a Cold War either. Now, there were other isolationists who shifted a bit and this was because, to a certain extent, their opposition to uh, entry into World War II was primarily based on opposition to communism. They thought that if you had a choice between the Nazis and the communists, it was really uh, it's the U.S. should avoid getting involved on either side, but it was better not to get involved on the communist side. The communists were worse. So from that point of view, what they wanted to do was uh, uh, once the Cold War had started, then they rather tended to shift and say, maybe the Cold War isn't so bad. Now, what aided this shift was that the, there was a new magazine, uh, National Review, founded by William Buckley, who was uh, had, uh, worked for the CIA and was, uh, in, uh, according to some accounts, that the CIA helped set up National Review under its uh, William Casey was one of the big figures there. So what they uh, did was to marginalize to the, great, the extent they could, the, uh, the figures from the old right who were opposed to the war. But I do think it worth notice that uh, there was a considerable, there, to a consider, at least some extent, I shouldn't say perhaps considerable, but to some extent, the, some of the figures on the, from the old revisionist historians uh, were still writing for National Review. For example, Harry Elmer Barnes wrote an article called Hiroshima Assault on a Beaten Foe, which was quite a revisionist article on uh, the end of World War II. And the revisionist historian Charles Callan Tansill, who was one of the greatest uh, revisionist writers, one of the absolute key figures, was extremely well thought of at in National Review circles. People would refer to him in very respectful terms, which is not surprising because he was, at, he was uh, one of the top two or three figures in American diplomatic history at the time, uh, along with uh, William Leonard Langer, who was his one-time uh, one friend of his. I think, well, I think they were still friends, but Barnes and Langer had split up long before, and uh, Samuel Flagg Bemis, who was definitely not a revisionist writer. But if you look at National Review in its years when it got started, there was considerable, uh, there was some openness to the uh, these ideas of the revisionist writers. And then the last point I would mention on how we had the shift from some of the old right 
opposition to war to a more support for the Cold War consensus was there was a tendency uh, among some of the uh, all, some of the figures on the old right, such as uh, John T. Flynn, and uh, especially and to emphasize how the U.S. foreign policy toward China had uh, lost China, as they put it, to the Chinese communists. And you uh, sort of the view there that was that there was internal subversion at uh, the uh, Amerasia Institute. There was a famous spy case. So, to some extent, the some of the old right figures tended to concentrate on internal communist subversion of the of the U of US policy and that opened them to a certain extent uh, could be argued how much to influence by ex communists and who had suddenly converted to opposition to communism and now called for renewal of the Cold War, and these would include figures at National Review like uh, Frank Meyer, who had been a longtime member of the uh, U.S. Communist Party, and the uh, uh, Wilhelm Schlamm, who had been in the German Communist Party, and then the uh, Trotskyite James Burnham. So it was the uh, interest in communist subversion, I think, that to some extent led to somewhat of a rapprochement between some of the old right figures and National Review. But in, in, to the extent the old right figures came out against the Cold War, they were marginalized and excluded by uh, William Buckley's policy. So uh, uh, I can't think of an appropriate joke to finish up. So I'll just stop <laughs> at this point. Well, good morning. And um, I'd like to thank uh, Paul for inviting me out. And of course, it's great to be back at Mises. Um, my talk is, is going to be about uh, the agrarians, but also about the Southern tradition in general. Because I don't think you can focus on the interwar South without talking about the tradition itself. And so it's broader than that, but I'm gonna bring that back to that interwar period. But I wanna start with a little story. Uh, in 1966, Senator Jim Eastland of Mississippi, who was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, walked into that, walked into that body and asked, feel hot in here? A staffer, probably from the North, replied, well, Senator, the thermostat is set at 72 degrees but we can make it colder. Eason looked puzzled by this. So he doubled down. He said, I said, feel hot in here. <laughs> well, the staffer who, I mean, now he can't figure what's, what's going on here. I mean, I'm going to get fired or something. So he says, look, uh, we're going to lower the temperature for you. And, and now Eastland was really irritated. He shot back, damn it, son. I said, it's Senator Phil, P-H-I-L, hot, H-A-R-T, in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I begin with a story because it's emblematic of the regionalism of the United States, or at least it used to be. Listening to congressional debates from the middle of the 20th century was like hearing a symphony of dialect. The Kennedy brothers, though hailing from Irish Catholic bootleggers, sounded like they were from an old Brahmin Massachusetts family. Stennis, Russell, Thurman, Irvin, and other Southerners brought their instruments to the show. Now, I attended school in Delaware, but my eighth grade English teacher was from Alabama. Yet because her husband was a minister and had to move around, she dropped her accent and adopted a flat Midwestern timber, all while assigning the great Southern writers or notably anti-Yankee partisans like Washington Irving. You see, you can take a girl out of Alabama, but you can't take the Alabama out of the girl. With a few exceptions, it would be hard to detect any regionalism among the current crop of 535 members of Congress. As Americans move and consume, 
we become less independent and more, and more plastic people dominated by Midwestern Yankee Puritanism. Recent studies have shown that children who move frequently are less likely to excel in school or in a social environment. They aren't from anywhere and have no real culture. This is by design. Nationalism creates a crop of drones with an Americanism that suggests saying the Pledge of Allegiance makes you an American and that Abraham Lincoln and Hamilton State Capitalist Dream are the greatest parts of American history. We've replaced Billy's Grocery, Harvey Lumber Company, and Daniel Appliance with Publix, Home Depot, and Best Buy. Buy your American flag at the Home Depot with your credit card during the President's Day sale in every town USA. Let's do this. The South always offered a counterweight to this type of Americanism, but today you can't sound Southern and still be taken seriously. Just as you can't suggest that anything from the Southern tradition is true and valuable without being slapped over the head with the book of bigotry. I'm surprised the modern left doesn't walk around like the monks in the Monty Python film, The Holy Grail, chanting, pious mother planet earth, save us from our privilege. Slap. <laughs> The only thing they haven't done is require a bonfire of the vanities and demand that every heretic throw some traditional vice, whether it's the Bible, your guns, precious metals, certainly your Confederate flags, into the fire in a communal cultural cleansing. It's probably coming. Now, Senator John Stennis of Mississippi said in 1974 that while people in the South lacked for money and lacked for worldly things, they got plenty of things money can't buy, like good neighbors, good friends, the community spirit of sharing with the other fellow. Sam Irvin, the last Jeffersonian to serve in the Senate, shared a similar sentiment when he suggested defeat was good for the soul because it shook the glory out. Irvin was from Burke, North Carolina, and the spirit of that place and the people there ran through his blood and bones. Some interwar Southerners knew that the world was changing, just as their ancestors knew the United States was, was destroyed by fire in 1865 and replaced with a unitary American empire beholden to Hamiltonian political economy and Yankee social engineering. The very thing John Taylor of Caroline and other old Republicans warned about in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Nothing had changed after the war. Robert Louis Dabney decried the New South Creed for its infatuation with progress in all forms. Industrialization was simply the mistress of social transformation and the destruction of tradition. The fusion of big banks, big business, and unconstitutional big government, along with government-sponsored social engineering, made for a Frankenstein that could not be tamed. There is a reason popular Senator Tom Watson of Georgia titled his newspaper The Jeffersonian in the early 20th century. The continuity between generations, the traditions that shaped the, people, shaped the South and her people, were the most important part of Southern history and Southern identity. That identity has been remarkably consistent even when it seems otherwise. Take, for example, the efforts of progressive Southerners to tame the evils of Yankee finance capitalism and the pre-World War I Congress. The war saw the complete victory of Hamilton's economic system in the postbellum period, so protective tariffs and central banking and federally funded internal improvements and corruption, of course, single Republican rule. We can't forget that Hamilton said the best part of the British Constitution was corruption, and that's what he wanted. Southerners had some success in pushing back against these measures in the 1880s and 90s, but it wasn't until the Wilson administration that they achieved any sort of legislative victory. The Glass-Steagall Act, the Clayton Antitrust Act, the Underwood Tariff were all parts of a broad Southern effort to place a Jeffersonian stamp on the economy. These were undoubtedly big government and constitutionally dubious ideas and policies. But to these Southerners, using the apparatus the Republican Party created to undermine what they considered to be the backbone of anti-Southern, anti-Jeffersonian principles seemed natural. Oscar Underwood of Alabama even classified the Federal Reserve as a Jeffersonian-inspired central banking system. Henry D. Lamar Clayton of Alabama also secured federal loans for farmers in the 19-teens as a type of reparations for being punished by poverty after the war. But in spite of, or perhaps because of, the crushing economic dislocation, Southerners clung to their history, their, re their regionalism, and their culture, and used it as both a shield and a blanket when confronting modernity, or in some cases, adopting it. For example, Fuller Calloway, 
a southern industrialist in LaGrange, Georgia, just down the road from here, told, a, told muckraker Ida Tarbell that he made American citizens and used cotton mills to pay the expenses. His son, Cason Calloway, focused his energy on scientific agriculture and eventually made his Blue Springs farm a private nature reserve called Calloway Gardens. He and his wife, Virginia, cultivated the Jeffersonian agrarian spirit and believed the independent farmer and localism, again, were essential for America. The family farm dominated their lives, and azaleas, blue spring water, woods, and outdoor recreation were their southern legacy. This is something every southerner took for granted in the 1920s and 30s. Jimmy Carter's Agrarian Manifesto, An Hour Before Daylight, portrays his father as a Jeffersonian worried about New Deal regulations on hogs and tomatoes. Like a good Yankee, Franklin Roosevelt drove through Georgia and thought he could fix it. It's no coincidence that the first industrial hog slaughterhouses appeared in the United States in the 1930s. Chicken houses followed in the 1950s, and soon industrial farming was ripping the family uh, farm apart, which was the backbone of the Southern tradition. The 12 Southerners who wrote I'll Take My Stand in 1930 could not have been more prophetic, and most people, even some Southerners, didn't want to listen to what Mary Cuff, in a recent piece in the modern age of all places, describes as an untenable pr prescription. She writes, quote, thus even for those who sympathize deeply with the agrarian diagnosis of modern society's ills, the social alienation and dehumanization triggered by sprawling urbanism, industrialization, and the dominance of technology, there is often the sense the agrarianism is unhelpful as a solution in the 21st century. These Southerners have been labeled romantics who hectored about farming and never picked up a plow. Southerners, even in the early 20th century, seem to agree. An 11-year-old named Lillian Natals of Magnolia, Mississippi, said in 1911, we like the mill work much better than farming. Five of her nine family members worked the mill. But these criticisms missed the point. Did agrarianism make the man, or did the man make agrarianism? More directly, was I'll take my stand an agrarian or a southern manifesto? The authors have called themselves, could have called themselves 12 farmers, 12 poets, or 12 writers, but they chose 12 Southerners, and the title is certainly a Southern choice. David Chandler, in his book, The Natural Superiority of Southern Politicians, wrote that the South has produced the preeminent geniuses of American political history. That genius was only made possible by Southern culture, the root of agrarianism. A southern man could still be an agrarian and not live on a farm. It certainly helped, but at its core, the southern agrarian tradition was based on an organic rhythm of life, a Christian sensibility of good friends and good communities, faith, property, independence, and a chivalric code that had honor as one of the highest traits of man in organized society. To be southern meant you embrace the old order of Western civilization as handed down by the Anglo-American traditions and peppered with the cultural mosaic of the various peoples that settled south of the Mason-Dixon. And as Southerners began to wrestle the implications of a Yankee victory in 1865, they became consciously more Southern. But that did not change their traditions. The historian Drew Gilpin Faust vaulted into a college presidency at Harvard by in part continually insisting that Confederate nationalism was inorganic, a creation of racism and white supremacy. But is this true? The evidence points in another direction. Edwin Alderman, the first president of the University of Virginia and editor of the Comprehensive Library of Southern Literature, told a University of California audience in 1906 that, quote, when the age of moral welfare shall succeed to the age of passionate gain getting, when blind social forces have wrought some tangle of inequality and of injustice, of hatred and suspicion, when calculation and combination can only weave the web more fiercely, when the whole people in some hour of national peril shall seek for the man of heart and faith who will not falter or frail, and the sweet justice of God, hither shall they turn for succor at the once, as they once turned to a simple Virginia planter. This southern tradition has nothing to do with race. It was an expression of the Jeffersonian mind, a critique of the Hamiltonian vision of America. Turning to the Virginia planter, the man of heart and faith, not the industrialist or the shopkeeper, had to be the solution. And that planter brought upon the traditions of his people, the story of his ancestor, men of action when time called for it, had to be a southerner, 
This was a call to Washington or Jefferson, not Lincoln or Grant, and certainly not J.P. Morgan or John D. Rockefeller. But would America, now in the throes of industrialization, look to the sage of Monticello for answers? And if not, how could a defeated people sell this tradition, or even should they? Literature professor Charles Kent advised Southerners to look inward, to become better Southerners, not co-opted Yankees. It seems, he wrote in 1907, much more desirable that we should endeavor to comprehend what our fathers stood for, especially in all manners relating to self-government, than study calmly our own situation and resolutely acknowledge and adapt the principles and policies that, mean so, that, mean, that seem excuse me, most con constant with our welfare. So far as my studies allow me to judge, no other people or fraction of people has a more admirable body of publicists from whose writings inspiration and guidance may be derived. And of course, he's talking about Southern literary figures. The Southerners who wrote I'll Take My Stand in 1930 and contributed to Who Owns America in 1936 took this challenge seriously. Who Owns America is in some respects a more interesting book than I'll Take My Stand. It is more prescriptive and less philosophical, a practical application of the principles the 12 Southerners sought to define just six years earlier. And while not explicitly Southern, focused like I'll Take My Stand, the Southern tradition drips from its pages. The great poet Donald Davison outlined a plan for regional government that incorporated Frederick Jackson Turner's prophecy that the core of American government was naturally the relation of, quote, section and nation, not state and nation. Davison called it a new federalism, not to be confused with Richard Nixon's bastardization of the term in the early 1970s, which really wasn't federalism at all. He wrote, quote, for the United States, the ideal condition would be this, that the region should be free to cultivate their own particular genius and to find their happiness along with their sustenance and security in pursuits to which their people are best adapted, the several regions supplementing and aiding each other in national comity under a well-balanced economy. This has not happened, he lamented, because the Constitution could not allow it. The result had been the clash of competing imperialisms with the Northeast the ultimate victor. The old outcry against Wall Street, Davison argued, is an outcry against a regional foe symbolized by a single institution. It means that the towers of New York are built upon southern and western backs. Andrew Nelson Lytle, the philosopher as historian and writer, he prays on Franklin Roosevelt for acknowledging the importance of the family farm, what Lytle called the livelihood farm. He was given FDR too much credit, of course, for Roosevelt's discovery that the Southern agrarian tradition was vital to American prosperity was like, telling August, was like Augustus telling Livy to write glowing histories of Rome in the first century AD, or Josiah Bailey of North Carolina writing the conservative manifesto, quote unquote, in 1936, warning about the pol a potential constitutional and legal hazards of the New Deal. In both cases, the empire had already consumed its parents. Regardless, Lytle insisted that a United States with one quarter of the people engaged as livelihood farmers would boast the most stable economy in its history. The tangible benefits would be seen in the welfare of the general population, what he termed the more natural living conditions. Lytle continued, this should be the most important end of polity, for only when families are fixed in their habits, sure of their property, hopeful for their security of their children, jealous of liberties which they cherish, can the state keep the middle course between impotence and tyranny? This required the Southern tradition, though. John Crow Ransom argued that the South may be a valuable accession to the scattering and unorganized party of all those who think it is time to turn away from the frenzy of big business towards something older, more American, and more profitable. What Ransom loathed and feared most was, the, was a South beholden to, quote, foreign ideas. Notice that he used the term American along with the descriptive older. The Southern agrarian tradition is older than the United States. The straight line from the old Republicans like John Taylor of Caroline to Ransom, Davidson, and Lytle should be easy to see. But that tradition, that older, more American vision of America, was swallowed up in the post-World War II nationalist orgy and Cold War propaganda. Us against them had no room for regionalism and Southern agrarianism. The machine age and the nuclear age required a Hamiltonian Americanism. We had to beat the commies, but more importantly, beating the commies required a civic religion. It also took aim at tradition, 
the very thing Dabney said would take place immediately following the war. Which brings us to 2019 and Tucker Carlson's now infamous, at least among neoconservatives, monologue criticizing what he called market capitalism. This was a clumsy, though refreshing, attempt to articulate the older, more American vision of the 12 Southerners. The establishment panned it as anti-capitalist and foolish, with media darling Ben Shapiro immediately going on the offensive in both print and video. Carlson mislabeled his enemy market capitalism. He was really throwing barbs at Hamilton's state capitalist system and the over-century-long Republican-led attempt to remake America, which they were more than open about saying in the 1860s. That involved an economic, social, political, and diplomatic transformation that replaced the older, more American world of the Southern agrarians with the Lincolnian American empire. Regardless, when Carlson asked for a fair country, a decent country, a cohesive country, a country whose leaders don't accelerate the forces of change purely for their own profit and amusement, a country you might recognize when you're old, a country that listens to young people who don't live in Brooklyn, that's a good idea, a country where you can make a solid living outside of the big cities. A country where Lewiston, Maine seems almost as important as the west side of Los Angeles. A country where environmentalism means getting outside and picking up the trash. A clean, orderly, stable country that respects itself. And above all, a country where normal people with an average education who grew up no place special can get married and have happy kids and repeat unto the generations. A country that actually cares about families, the building block of everything, when he said that, he was channeling the Jeffersonian America that dominated politics and culture till the close of war in 1865, and that found a voice in fits and spurts in the postbellum period, particularly from Southerners who knew they told you so. Richard Weaver offered the best explanation for why the Southern tradition still had currency in modern society in his excellent The Southern Tradition at Bay. He wrote, the South possesses an inheritance which has in which it has imperfectly understood and little used. It is in the curious position of having been right without realizing the grounds of its rightness. The interwar Southern critique of Hamilton's America came closest to doing so. And in the end, we are left with Weaver, Weaver's conclusion that the Southern tradition offers not an example, but a challenge. The challenge, he said, is to save the human spirit by recreating the non-materialist society. This is the very challenge Carlson offered his viewers, the 12 Southerners scribbled about, Dabney thundered from the pulpit, and Taylor of Caroline, the most Jeffersonian of all Jeffersonians, insisted we remember when he, when he faced Hamilton, or Hamilton's schemes. Weaver concluded by suggesting, quote, that the Old South may, may indeed be a hall hung with splendid tapestries in which no one would care to live, but from them we can learn something of how to live. You don't have to be a farmer to be an agrarian. We could all use a little more of the Southern tradition, but it's up to us to take the challenge of saving the human spirit through an older, more American worldview seriously. Thank you for your time. I would like to apologize to David for having misrepresented his talk. It was not on Austrian economics, uh, but on uh, the position of the old right vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Europe and uh, its position on military intervention. And uh, I agreed with what he said. I, I, let me also uh, uh, note that uh, I was very impressed by Brian's talk, particularly his critique of American nationalism. Uh, which I think is a toxic force, um, and it is something that has uh, that is artificial in a way that French or German nationalism is not, uh, and is 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 it very much of a construct used uh, to impose centralized government and to involve the United States in perpetual war for perpetual peace. Um, I, I did vote for Pat Buchanan for president, but um, I got sick to my stomach every time he used the word American nationalism. Uh, it, 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 it immediately evoked in my mind uh, speeches given by neoconservatives at AEI. Uh, and uh, I, I thought the defense, uh, Brian's defense of regionalism uh, against nationalism, at least in my case, was very well received. Um, what I would like to talk about are, are uh, uh, figures of the interwar right uh, 
who meet my demanding criteria of what exactly constitutes the right or who belongs to the right. Um, and there are certain criteria that I applied in coming up with these names. And the, and the list, by the way, is not um, comprehensive or doesn't include everybody, but it does, uh, I do try to touch on people or mention people uh, who seem to who fit the definition of what a right is, um, at least in this interwar period in the United States. One of the criteria, I think, the opposition to technical society, um, or to society in which people have sort of lost their, their roots in nature, uh, the uh, revulsion for what is seen as massification or uh, uh, mass society, and of course, nostalgia for an older America. They're always sort of looking back to an earlier time. Um, there's also an opposition to what Robertson, uh, Robertson uh, Jeffers, who I think is a quintessential representative of this, of this interwar right, American right, described in his poem on Pearl Harbor as the hope to impose on the whole planetary world an American peace. And by the way, in, in some many ways, this, this, this poem is prescient that he wrote uh, right, uh, right, right after Pearl Harbor, warning against an American empire, which I think was, was obviously not a discreet act at the time that it was performed. Uh, but, you know, he says that, um, uh, as for me, what can I do now but fly the national flag from the top of the tower? America has neither race nor religion, nor its own language. Uh, it has, uh, either it is to be a nation or nothing. Uh, and he's saying this sarcastically, uh, that, that, that America is not based any longer on those things in which national identities have been rooted. Um, uh, it is something that uh, manifests itself, what we are told manifests itself when America fights uh, a military crusade. And uh, he goes on to say that this is, um, these are the men who conspired and labored to embroil this republic in the wreck of Europe. Uh, he was also complaining about uh, intervention going back to World War I, uh, which, he had, which he had also opposed. Um, to, to read these, uh, I think what is perhaps the uh, the key lines in this uh, poetic effort, uh, which I will now do, the, the war that we have carefully worked for years provoked, catches us unprepared, amazed and indignant. Our warships are shot like sitting ducks and our planes like nest birds. Both our coast ridiculously panicked. Our leaders make orations. This is the people that hopes to impose on the whole planetary world an American peace. This was written in December of 1941, I should point out, a week after I was born, uh, <laughs> have some idea of how old it is, uh, but but it seems to be describing uh, the uh, the American vision of Fox News that you can turn on every night and hear, right? Um, so, uh, well, I say there, there's a protest against military involvement, uh, but it also, I think, in this case, expresses almost a, a kind of rightist impulse um, because he is concerned Jeffers with the politically and culturally destructive effects of this perpetual war for perpetual peace uh, on the fabric of what then remained of a traditional American society. Uh, I'm not including the objections of selective communist or pro-communist opponents to certain ideologically unpalatable wars. For example, George McGovern's protest against the Vietnam War while justifying the dropping of bombs on helpless civilians in what he took to be a politically correct war in which the United States uh, was happily allied to the Soviet Union. Um, I do not consider McGovern to be uh, somebody who opposes war on principle or opposes war because he sees it as having uh, disruptive effects on civilization, but someone who probably took the position which he did uh, for um, blatantly ideological reasons. Uh, I would also say that people who you know, sort of fit my definition of the right, um, see a spiritual dimension together with, uh, with animating political positions. Um, in the case of uh, Wallace Stevens, uh, who also I think is, is, a, uh, is not only a great poet, but he's definitely a figure of the right, uh, in some ways sees poetry as a replacement for traditional religion, though toward the end of his life he returns to Christianity. Um, and the, uh, J Jeffers is somebody who uh, uh, expresses what is a philosophical position called anti-humanism, uh, 
uh, which uh, I do not consider to be some kind of coherent or systematic approach to the subject of philosophy, but it uh, it seems to be based on a kind of reverence for nature, or living living in the natural world. Uh, he was not, by the way, uh, uh, a supporter. He would not have been a supporter of the Green Revolution, uh, and he was very distrustful uh, of, of of our centralized government. Um, there also, obviously, is a criticism of de- the idea of democratic equality, and particularly expressed in the efforts of the modern administrative state to further this goal. Uh, and I notice that as I'm listening to these people, there's a predominance of men of letters. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not really, I, I do not look down upon radically individualist authors like uh, Isabel Patterson, but I don't think she really qualifies as a figure of the right in the same way that some of the other people like Wallace Stevens, Robertson Jeffer, uh, George Santiano, who, by the way, was uh, uh, was Wallace Stevens' teacher at Harvard and his longtime correspondent, Robert Lee Frost. And if you notice his first name is Robert Lee, Robert Lee, although he was born in Oregon, his family was strongly pro-Confederate in the Civil War. And of course, uh, the man, the, the namesake of the organization that I had, H.L. Mencken, um, all belong on this list. One might say this, this, this very select list uh, uh, of, uh, of thinkers uh, of the right. Um, and I'm not mentioning the people whom, whom Brian discussed, who definitely, I think, are figures of the right, the Southern agrarians, nor am I mentioning the pro-fascist literati like Lovecraft and Ezra Pound, who are generally assigned on the right, although uh, we might quibble with that, uh, with that positioning. Many of these rightist authors consider themselves to be modernists, Stevens, Pound, Jeffers, uh, but as has been frequently observed, modernist writers were often political reactionaries. They were usually political reactionaries who combined literary innovation and decidedly rightist opinions about politics. Significantly, not only Mencken, but Stevens admired Nietzsche, although in Stevens' case, the admiration was motivated by aesthetic affinity rather than assumed political agreement. This occasions the inevitable question of why so many generation-defining writers, particularly poets in the interwar years, took political and cultural positions that were diametrically opposed to those of our current literary and cultural elites. Allow me to provide one obvious answer that would cause me to be dismissed from an academic post if I were still unlucky enough to hold one. Some of the names I've been listing belong to the families of long-settled or, or, or were the scions of long-settled WASP elite, Frost, Stevens, Jeffers, and at least on one side, Santiana, the other side of his family was, were Spanish, one side were New England Puritans. Uh, and these figures cherished memories of an older American society that they considered in crisis. Jeffers was the son of a Presbyterian minister from Pittsburgh uh, who was a well-known classical scholar. By the time that Jeffers was 12, this future poet and precocious linguist knew German and French well, uh, and later followed the example of his minister fathered by studying classics in Europe as well as in the U.S. Other figures of the literary right despised egalitarianism, which was a defining attitude of the self-identified Nietzschean Mencken. The sage of Baltimore typified what the Italian Marxist Domenico Losordo describes as aristocratic individualism and which Lasordo and Mencken identified with Nietzsche. This anti-egalitarian individualism was also present in such figures uh, as the Jeffersonian libertarian uh, Albert J. Nock. It may be Nock's memoirs of a superfluous man with its laments against modern leveling tendencies and Nock's earlier work, Our Enemy the State, which came out in 1935, which incorporated most persuasively for me the concept of aristocratic individualism perhaps more, more so than in the case of Mencken, uh, who is basically a journalist who, when he writes on deeper questions, is often, you know, uh, uh, obviously out of his element. Um, Nock opposed the modern state, not principally because he disapproved of its economic policies, although he may not have liked them as well, but because he viewed it as an instrument of destroying valid human distinctions. His revisionist work, Myth of a Guilty Nation, which I'm about to reread, has not lost its power since Knox's attack on World War I allied propaganda was first published in 1922. 
even more than Mencken, whose anti-war fervor in 1914 may have reflected his strongly pro-German bias, Nock opposed American involvement in World War I for the proper moral reasons, namely that the Western world was devouring itself in a totally needless conflagration. Curiously, the self-described Berkey and Russell Kirk depicts his discovery of, Men Men of Nock's memoirs of a superfluous man um, on an isolated army base in Utah during World War II as a spiritual awakening. Robert Nisbet recounts the same experience in the same way in very similar circumstances. These interwar writers of various stripes took advantage of rich academic, educational, as well as literary milieu that was still dominated by a predominantly wasp patrician class before its descendants sank into Jed Bushism or even worse. They were, still, they were still living in a society featuring classes, gender roles, predominantly family-owned factories and farms, small-town manners, and bourgeois decencies. Even those who, like Jeffers, Nock, and Mencken, view themselves as iconoclast, uh, even, uh, today would seem, even, uh, even to our fake conservatives, to be thoroughly reactionary. The world has changed many times in many ways since these iconoclasts walked the earth. I still recall attending a seminar of literary scholars as a graduate student in Yale in 1965, 10 years after the death of Wallace Stevens in Hartford, Connecticut, and being informed that although Stevens was a distinguished poet, it was rumored that he was a Republican. Someone else then chimed in that Stevens was supposed to have opposed the New Deal, something that caused consternation among those who were attending. At the time, I had reservations about the same political development, but kept my views to myself. I was still very young and had no professional standing of any kind, so I thought I would not uh, express my uh, loathing for the New Deal and progressivism and so forth. I just listened to my elders and then went back to my dorm room. One could only imagine what the acceptance price for a poet in a comparable academic circle at Yale would be right now. Perhaps the advocacy of state-required trans transgendered restrooms spaced 20 feet apart, uh, or having a transgendered moderator leading the discussion, I shudder to think. But arguably the signs of what was to come were already present back in the mid-1960s. What was fading was the academic society that still existed when Stevens attended Harvard, Frost, Dartmouth, the only first semester, or knock the still recognizably traditional Episcopal Bard College. Our elite universities were not likely to produce, even in the 1960s, pleiads of right-wing iconoclasts, as they had in the interwar years and even before the First World War. And not incidentally, the form of American conservatism that came out of Yale in the post-war years quickly degenerated into something far less appealing than what, what it replaced. It became a movement in which members taught, were taught to march in lockstep, and the glue for which was advocacy of a perpetual military crusade. The step had already been taken that led from the interwar right to what is today conservatism. Somehow the interwar tradition looks better and better with the passage of time. Thank you. Uh, I'll stay up here. Uh, I think we have time for some questions, don't we? I have a question for Paul and for David. Um, I know Mencken was uh, basically a literate and a journalist, but can we consider him a consistent libertarian? I, I would tend to uh, view Mencken uh, perhaps a bit more favorably as an intellectual. When Paul did, he kept, he kept up with a lot of uh, literary developments, he was, uh, although he, he was, I think he, he was one of the discoverers of Theodore Dreiser as a writer, whether that's good or bad, I'll leave to other people to say, but he, he had very strong tastes in literature. He was, he didn't care for some of the newer trends. So I think he, he's, but he is, I think, uh, significant mainly as a, for his literary writer and a wit uh, more than as a major intellectual, but he was certainly an important figure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, 
Covering as far as going back to the very first question, um, I recently have started to push for uh, someone to write a book on the international, uh, the history of the international financing of war and meddling with this. Another aspect is meddling with culture and the centralization effect of that. I'm kind of wondering, uh, Brian, as far as the Hamiltonians were saying that they were looking at doing this and they were saying that, that, that this was their agenda. Is there any book that surveys the regulations and laws and, that were designed to and had, that would have the effect of destroying uh, Southern culture? And is there any book that you know that covers this also through history as culture as a weapon? Because you hear many, many politicians say that culture precedes politics. So if you can destroy cult culture, it's waging war by another means, a la Clausewitz. You know, politics is a con uh, war is a conducting of politics by other means. Uh, I think one of the best, uh, if you just want to talk about the Reconstruction period, speaking of my thing. On the Reconstruction period, um, now he's you don't want to be caught reading this book uh, and if you're in graduate school. Uh, but it's E. Merton Coulter's The South During Reconstruction because he gets into the cultural imperialism of the North. I mean, and things like sport, right? So we, in the South here, we, we take for granted it's Saturday. We're right across the street from the football stadium over here. And uh, we're going to go see uh, the Tigers play, whoever. And that's the biggest day in the South, Saturday. Uh, but that's a, that's a Yankee, that's Yankee imperialism. All of our ball games were brought from the north. So when you look at southern sport, it was blood sports. Um, it was you know horse racing, these kind of things. And so that was certainly part of it. And, and southerners were aware of these things. Now, not everyone rejected it, of course. I mean, we've got McDonald's all over the place. You've got you, you, southerners like this. Why I brought up the quote from the little girl in Mississippi who said, "You know, we like working in the factory because it's better than the farm." Um, but I think that particular book gets into that idea. Now, um, as far as others moving forward, I mean, you can, if you read, you know, I'll take my stand. If you read Who Owns America, they, they talk about this quite a bit, uh, the agrarians do, because they were fully aware by that point now, 70 years later, um, what had actually happened. Dabney is very good uh, because he's not only criticizing the Hamiltonian economic system that's being foisted on the South, he's also talking about things like uh, these social transformations, and not just race, but in other areas uh, that are going on in the South that he thought were, were uh, you opened a Pandora's box. Um, and if you look at the reformist movements after the war, uh, it, was, it was broader and, of course, more comprehensive than just uh, the Republican Party pushing, um, uh, you know, for the 13th Amendment or 14th Amendment. There was, it was bigger than that. So um, certainly Southerners are looking at the world and saying, I, I, I'm not certain that... Uh, what we're doing here, if we're just in a reconciliationist position where we're gonna say Abraham Lincoln was good for America, uh, we're, we're, we're going to accept that um, and then move on. I mean, there were other things happening behind the scenes and, and Southerners were aware of it, uh, but, and they were warning people about it. You know, you've, you've said this, okay, we'll, we'll agree with, with doing this, but then what comes after that uh, was the big question. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you should read Dabney, read, read Coulter, read, uh, read The Agrarians, it, it's very good. One point on when you're talking about the uh, culture, how <clears throat> how the uh, government support for various cultural movements is interesting. After World War II, there's <clears throat> I think some evidence the CIA uh, sponsored modernist art, for example, in the paintings of Jackson Pollock. You remember Pollock was the one who would drive a motorcycle across the canvas. Uh, you might say, well, why would, why would they have any interest in doing that? Uh, one, I think the argument was something like what they were trying to combat was the aesthetics of what was called socialist realism, which was kind of a monumental style of art and architecture. So the thought was, well, uh, by having this kind of art were were undermining socialist realism. And just just uh, to skip to something else, which I often do in uh, what Brian was mentioning on on uh, the historian uh, E. Merson Coulter, it's interesting, some of the attacks on the Southern historians started on Reconstruction elsewhere, started off explicitly by, by the Communist Party. For example, uh, Herbert Apthaker, 
had a one of his works had a big attack on culture. He says, "Oh, you never. This is really an awful person. You never want to read him because he was so anti-black. He criticized the Reconstruction governments. He, you never. This is a really terrible person. So, a lot, a, a good deal. I wouldn't say entirely, but a good deal of the movement against the uh, more traditional interpretation." of the Reconstruction period, of the black Reconstruction governments as being especially corrupt, uh, came about uh, through the Communist Party. Like if we look, for example, at an earlier work, the book by the left-leaning uh, Claude Bowers called The Tragic Era on Reconstruction, and Bowers was certainly not a reactionary. He was uh, ambassador to... Uh, the Re Republican Spain, he was very sympathetic to the uh, Republican side in the Spanish Civil War, but he was very much very critical of the Reconstruction governments, but now that view is out. It's regarded as forbidden to say that. Well, I mean, that's a very good question, uh, because you're talking essentially about the populist movement. And um, Brian, actually, his family is from Georgia. So uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a little place down the road here, Lumpkin, Georgia, now it's moved to Columbus, but Westville, and it's a living little 1850s living history, like Williamsburg, but for the 1850s. And they have the Brian house there, and that was his family. Um, but he's from Georgia, and of course, there was a there, there were a lot of similarities between the Midwestern populists and the Southern populists. And I think one point the agrarians make is that, and I brought it up in the quote about the West and the South, New York built on the backs of the West and the South. Westerners in the pre-war period sided with the Republican Party because they were anti-slavery. And um, so that was a way for them, okay, we don't want slaves in our states. We don't even want blacks in our states. And we're going to have laws against that. Uh, so we, we want to keep that out of the West, and we'll cut a deal with these New Englanders who want big banks and tariffs and all these kind of things because that's going to be an alliance that will work for us at the time. But then after the war is over and you have the McKinley tariff and you have, uh, you have uh, the, the promotion of a central banking system, you get these things, the Hamiltonian system really being pushed, they realized, oops, we've, we've cut a deal here that we don't want to be part of anymore. So then you started seeing these Midwestern populists uh, break off, and you know James James Weaver, who was the the populist uh, People's Party presidential candidate uh, in 1892, wrote a really interesting little book. It's very Jeffersonian, and I think that um, there was a lot of similarities. I, I think the one thing that the that the Western populist, and this filtered into the South eventually, and this this use of the general government to push legislation that was the same apparatus, they would just use that to work against the big bankers. And Southerners just finally said, yeah, we'll do that too. We'll go with it. We're going to drop our long-standing opposition to a big central government because, I mean, why, 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 why not use it to get them? I mean, these people have been punching us for years. So there's a lot of similarities. You know, um, Tom Watson, uh, the populist leader of Georgia, would have similarities with some, you know, James Weaver, and you had the Texas uh, group, uh, and the, the Texas Alliance and the Farmers Alliance and these kind of groups, which were... Uh, very, very similar. So I don't think by the time you get to the 1890s, there was a whole lot of difference. Um, I would say that maybe the, the Midwestern populists were a little bit more left-leaning than the Southern populists, but um, that was, that's, I think, if you, if you read Brian, uh, there was actually a piece I found Brian wrote in his, in his uh, newspaper, because he, he controlled a newspaper there in Nebraska, uh, that was, uh, it was very complimentary of the South. And it took this position, that the reconciliation, reconciliation position. Okay, well, I mean, it's good to work, but we need to recognize the South was had this. They, they were good people too. We just had we, we just had a difference, and now it's over. And now we're going to unify against the the real enemy, which is big banks and big business. So I, I think that's the best way I can answer your question. Here. Oh. <laughs> 
get into this with the Russian to hear about in the war, right? Uh, but do you think we already lost that? Do you think that Russia, I mean, France, uh, he made a point that we lost cultural war politically. And we don't see there are giants in like the 30s, intellectual giants, literary giants, historians. Now we don't see anybody on the right except living by the necessity. And uh, also with them, um, uh, if there'll be if there will be a panel like this in 2050, in the same very place we are sitting today, uh, whom do you think we would talk about? Mm. Let, let, let me, I, I, I agree with, with what you say. Uh, I'll take the, the microphone. Um, but one of, and one of the curious things that I've been noticing is that people who, I've been discussing this with, with Brian before, people who discuss what were left of center views 30 or 40 years ago, are now featured as conservative historians. Um, Victor Davis Hanson has uh, traditional leftist views on foreign policy. Uh, I, I heard him talk once. He praised the Republican side in the Spanish Civil War. It was a war against fascism. Um, uh, in fact, most of his historical views would fit very easily with those of my leftist professors when I went to Yale in the mid 1960s, uh, now he's considered to be, you know, a, a true conservative historian. He's a uh, he's a friend of Donald Trump or something. And right now there there is a war between him and some other people on this uh, this pseudo right, uh, in which you know they're against him because they see him as being too far to the right, you know. So. Uh, uh, historians of, of uh, someone, someone like C.V.N. Woodward, who I actually I, I studied with at one time, was one of my teachers, um, would today be considered a fascist if he were teaching. Uh, although he was definitely a leftist at the time, I, I think he balked at the idea of voting for McGovern, though he may have swallowed hard and then and then then, vote, then he did vote for him. I think. Um, but the, uh, uh, the, the, the political spectrum has, be, has definitely moved to the left, uh, and historical studies have been definitely influenced by political correctness. Historians have been in the vanguard of political correctness. Uh, so if you're looking for you know, impartial historians writing on Reconstruction, this, you're not going to find them. One of the projects that I, I mentioned this to Brian, I, I, I've been thinking, I finish all the other books I'm working on, if I survive that long, I'd like to write a book on penitential history, that this is one of my, because what historians do today, you know, is help us expiate all of our sins. Uh, and, you know, they start with, with Germans being entirely responsible for World War I, which is utter nonsense. We don't have to say anything else in that country. They'll, they'll, they'll send you to a rehabilitation camp if you do. Um, and uh, Eric Foner, you know, dominates Reconstruction history, and he's writing, he's pushing his political agenda into, not writing very good history. Um, but this seems to be very characteristic of the age in which we're living. And people do not get criticized for writing dubious accounts. They're praised in the New York Times. And if you criticize them, you're a racist, you're a sexist, or something. This is the way historical studies are now pursued. Um, and I really have no hope of seeing it get better in my lifetime. Uh, uh, so, you know, I, I think, I think this, this is something that should be addressed. You know, why have historical studies degenerated to the point that they have? Did you want to add anything? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that I'm a little more optimistic in that because Mises exists, because you have all the fellows and the students, because, you know, I work with the Abbey Bill Institute and we have students with that too. I, I think there could be, now, we're not going to work through the, through the traditional institutions. You're going to have to publish outside of that. But the internet is the great leveler. As long as we can keep that free and open to dialogue and, and ideas, um, there is, I think, hope that uh, there will be a future crop of students. Now, I always advise students, uh, go, through, go through graduate school and, and not, don't make any waves and then get out and get a job, and then get tenure, and then you can do what you want. Uh, but at that point, in, in, before you get there, uh, you can you can be who you are. I think you know Paul did that in graduate school. He seems like he didn't. He said he didn't make any waves, so he got through. And nobody knew that he was who he was yet. Uh, that took time. Uh, so uh, I, I did the exact opposite thing. I went and worked with Clive Wilson, and everybody knew who I was. So I was doomed <laughs> from the beginning. But. Uh, I think that uh, I still have hope that this could change. I mean, the pendulum swings back and forth, and 
And uh, you know, right now it's uh, we're at, we're at low tide uh, for for uh, real scholarship and discourse. And maybe people will get tired of of just being beat over the head. You know, pious Mother Earth, save us from our privilege. Maybe maybe they'll get tired of that. Uh, and there's going to be some real thought and people actually engaging in real discourse in the future. I, I don't know. Well, I think in uh, considering how history has become more politically correct, it's quite amazing how far this is spread. For example, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, the uh, great authorities on uh, on uh, the uh, uh, on the Ar- the so-called Aryan period, or it was. Georges Dumézil, he wrote on kind of a structure, a structure of society, it, certain in uh, ancient history, and he was criticized by another historian, Carlo Ginzburg, for having pro-fascist views, just because he was talking about sort of trying to trace kind of a proto-Aryan taking this kind of as a linguistic notion. So. Even in a field uh, you would think is uh, immune to political correctness, is uh, is uh, philology. You find the same idea where people are are supposed to be politically correct, and uh, it's. Uh, I guess now many people have sort of also a kind of very moralistic attitude toward history, where. The historian is kind of viewed as a, a judge who's condemning people in in the past. They, they have the attitude. It's like the uh, the line from James Joyce: "History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awaken." I think that tends to be an attitude prevalent. Yes, days. I uh, I think we have reached the end of this uh, stimulating session, and I thank you all for coming and. You are now dismissed and can go to lunch.